Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Julie Raymeyer. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. I'm so thrilled to be here today. When I heard about your book, my heart literally leaped up because you have written a book called Through the Shadowlands, A Science Writer's Odyssey into an Illness Science Doesn't Understand. And here's the cover. So, in effect, uh, you know, you will correct me, of course, but it's in the broad sense about environmental illness and how... Right people just have blinders on and, and there hasn't been research. The people who suffer from these diseases are ostracized and ignored. And you, with your background as a science writer and as a patient, you do this hero's journey through your disease to, you know, it's an healing is always ongoing. Right. But um, I'm so grateful to you for bringing this topic up. I think, it's, I think as you say, things are shifting. So tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, so I'm thrilled to have the book come out. It's part of a uh, a long process for me, so it's really exciting. I uh, first started getting sick, gosh, way back in 1999, and for me it was a gradual onset. For many patients, it's sudden. They can they know the hour they got sick, but for me it was gradual, and I just didn't have the energy I once had. And initially, I thought it was just overwork and stress. I was building my own house and working full time and my husband was ill and um, but it was a little too extreme for that. You know, I, I found myself tracing my hand along the wall as I walked to the bathroom because I thought I might pass out. That didn't quite seem normal. But still I figured I just needed to get my life in order and everything would be fine. So I did get my life in order and everything wasn't fine. In particular my ability to exercise didn't come back. And in retrospect, that was the, the really alarming thing. Um, when I exercised, I felt terrible the next day. And I had always loved exercise. I was on a search and rescue team. I built my own house. I ran a marathon, you know, loved exercise. So I, I still just figured, well, it'll be okay. Just give it time. Don't get too worked up about it, and it'll be okay. And... And I was more or less manageable with some weird things along the way until 2006. And then I woke up one morning and I couldn't walk and could barely stagger to the bathroom. And at that point, it was clear that something was really wrong here. And I went to a neurologist and he diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome. And I thought, fatigue? Like, you know, yeah, I've been tired for years. I wondered if I might have chronic fatigue syndrome, but this isn't fatigue. I can't walk. This is paralysis. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, you know, what are you talking about? And then then I was like, okay, so, you know, tests, treatments, other doctors, what do I do here? Well, he had nothing to offer. For him, it clearly meant, please get out of my office. Uh, go away. It was really a shocking experience. So... That was kind of the beginning for me of entering this whole world of chronic fatigue syndrome. I went to a variety of other doctors and quickly realized that doctors did not have very much to offer. Because I'm a science writer, then I went and dug into the science, scientific literature, and I quickly figured out why doctors had so little to offer. The reason was that there was very little science and very little good science. There were many small studies that hadn't been replicated, so you know who knows whether they would stand up. And they just didn't really add up to much. There were, you know, bazillions of abnormalities that people had found. But what was the core of it? What was really going on? Nobody knew. And from, I learned from your book that not only was there very little research, but some of the research was flat out wrong. That's exactly right. The pace right. study. That's right. So the, 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 <laughs> the research has varied from uh, lousy to absolutely terrible. <laughs> so the PACE trial is the big example of absolutely terrible. So this study came out in 2011. It was published in The Lancet, which is an extremely prestigious medical journal. Um, it was a, a um, $8 million study, so a big, expensive study, 640 patients, headlines around the world. Um, and it claimed that cognitive behavioral therapy 
uh, which is a form of psychotherapy, and gradually increasing exercise can help or even cure chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. And I saw a headline about it in the New York Times, and by that point I was much, much sicker. I had had an additional collapse, and I was bed-bound much of the time. And I thought, psychotherapy exercise? Because it just completely contradicted my experience of the disease as a patient. My experience was that the way to maximize the amount that I could do was to stop the first moment I thought, I'm a little tired. And if I kept going, then I really paid for it and would the next day be able to do much, much less. So that was what I had learned was don't, don't gradually increase it um, because, you know, one day I might be able to swim for 10 minutes and the next day only five. So if I had an expectation that I'd always going, be going up, then I would get myself in really big trouble. So it just, uh, it didn't smell right at all. But I, it was this big conundrum for me because, you know, as I say, it was this big study, prestigious, uh, seemed really good. And how could it be? You know, what was going on here? It was a real puzzle for me. And at the time, I was too sick to figure it out. But over the following months and years, then I really dug into the science of the trial. And what I discovered was really shocking. There are so many problems with the trial, I can't list them all. But the most obvious one is they changed their standards for success after the trial began. And so, you know, basically they, they, you know, they weren't winning, and so they moved the goalposts. And for recovery, they made their definition of recovery so weak that patients could enter the trial, get worse on their two main measures, which measured fatigue and physical function, and still be said to be recovered. Mm. So it was, it was really shocking. And as I say, there are so many problems with the trial. It just goes on and on and on. There are problems at all levels. And patients pointed this out for years. Patients you know, were really on top of this. Some extremely scientifically savvy patients, both scientifically trained and, and patients who just got in there and smart people who figured it out. And their complaints were completely ignored. And the researchers attacked and vilified them. Um, you know, painted them as being like violent animal rights activists. Um, and the press ate it up, ate it up, you know, reported endlessly on these crazy patients attacking the researchers for no reason and would not look into the, into the scientific criticisms of the trial. So that was a kind of tragic end to your scientific research in this. When you still needed help in, in the age of the internet, you were able to find some other resources that perhaps you were questioning at the beginning. That's right. So what happened was um, in 2011, which was the time this trial came out, I had this huge collapse. I was extremely sick and had, I went off to the very top medical specialists in the world and they were wonderful people and ultimately couldn't really help. So I'd pretty much run out of medical options. I was living by myself. I was really too sick to take care of myself. I didn't have much family to turn to. I was running out of money, uh, could barely work. It was a really frightening time. And I managed to write a story for Slate, the online magazine Slate, about chronic fatigue syndrome. And as a result of that story, I got contacted by patients on Facebook, sent me friend requests, which I accepted, what the heck. Mm -hmm. And a group of these patients claimed that by taking extreme measures to avoid mold, that they had experienced enormous improvements. And my initial reaction was, what a load of hooey, pseudoscience, I don't believe it. Um, but, you know, I kept seeing their posts and there was a link to a blog post from a young man who had spent two months living in the desert in a cargo trailer and he posted pictures of himself running again, which just blew my mind. He was running and lifting weights, and he said he'd been sicker than I was. So that was just mind-blowing to me, and I thought, okay, well, it won't do any harm to just ask them some questions. So I started talking to these to moldies, they call themselves. I started talking to the moldies, 
And they told me about their experiences and their theories and whatnot. And they, their advice to me was that I should go spend two weeks in the desert with none of my own belongings uh, on the theory that my own stuff was contaminated with mold. And this would allow me to completely get away from the toxic mold that, on their theory, was making me sick. And they said that I might or might not feel better while I was there, but that when I came home, that I would react really clearly and strongly to my own stuff. You did take one beloved belonging. You took your wonderful dog, Francis, and you said did. you washed her in vinegar, probably I did. her favorite <laughs> bath, to be sure that there were no spores and everything on her. Right. Everything else, I think you borrowed clothes, borrowed a tent, you know, all new stuff. That's right. And off you went. That's right. Tell us where you went. And I went to Death Valley. And I'll tell you, I actually didn't want to go to Death Valley because I had been there with a previous partner. I thought, you know, there are lots of other places. Can't I go somewhere else? Well, it turned out that for various reasons, Death Valley was the best choice in February when it's cold. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it seemed so poetically perfect because I really felt as though I was going to the desert to die. You know, not literally. I didn't expect to be carried out in a coffin. But I was just at the end of the road. You know, I'd been sick by that point for, for a dozen years. Um, I was just, uh, for so long, I'd kind of kept my life going in spite of it all. But I was just too sick for that. And I just couldn't do it. And it felt like the kind of the path I'd been following had just come to an end. And I didn't know what was going to come next. So, so yeah, so I drove off to Death Valley. I was on a little bit of an upswing, which made me think I might be able to pull it off. And I spent two weeks in Death Valley with uh, just my dog, Francis. Uh, and it was an amazing, amazing experience for me. I, I had no idea whether it would work or not and was still guessing that it probably wouldn't work for me. I didn't have much evidence that mold was my problem. But I had this experience there it's so, it's such a beautiful place. It's so barren and so spacious. There's, there are no people around. You know, I was just off in the middle of nowhere in Death Valley with nobody around. And I felt as though all the kind of expectations that I'd had from my life kind of dissolved and all my sense of obligation dissolved. I had worked so hard all my life, you know, trying to be a success and accomplish things and be a good neighbor and a good citizen and do my work and all of that kind of thing. And, and when I was there, it just felt like way too much. And all of that sense of obligation and responsibility and it just kind of dissolved. And I had this experience that just breathing felt like a gift and mm -hmm. felt like all I needed to do you know, sweeping sand out of my tent, watching the colors change over the course of the day, it felt quite sufficient, like it was a full life. We're speaking today with Julie Raymeyer about her book, Through the Shadowlands, and her really amazing personal odyssey through a disease, as you say, that science doesn't understand. So we're halfway through, so we're gonna have to accelerate a little bit. So. You've, did you feel better actually while you were in Death Valley, or was it when you came back? So I felt slightly better in Death Valley, but not enough to be impressive. Um, I came back, and 30 seconds in, uh, with my own stuff in the place I was living was enough to cripple me. It was really clear and astonishing. So I stayed away from my stuff and stayed with friends. Um, and a week after I got back from Death Valley... I decided to go for a little little walk with my dog. I ended up climbing to the top of a 350-foot hill. Which you hadn't been able to do for a year and a half. Yeah. A year and a half. Yeah. And I was just blown away, just blown away, because that was the first indication that this was actually going to make me better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. So um, you worked with some of the moldies, as you call them, and it's interesting in this age of Wonder Woman that you had developed a superpower, <laughs> which was your body could tell if there was mold, and you knew to to wash, get rid of the clothes, and you, you could feel in your body if this was a dangerous place for you. That's right. And, um, and you reported this back to the community, too. 
Right. That's right. So then, so you, you were then able to uh, go back to your home, mm -hmm. and that was okay. That was a right. shrub so was a huge hand built house. That you yes, built. a huge blessing that my own house turned out to be a safe <laughs> yeah, place for me yeah. to heal. It's not where I had been living previously. So, and so um, you you you've been on this. So the whole disease episode, although it's continuing, but in a much more diminished capacity, 12 and a half, 13 years, is that about yeah. right? Yeah. That's a long road. It was, yeah, it's been a very long road. Yeah. <laughs> um, you obviously kept really good records, and, and I love the honesty of your voice in this, you know, when you describe not having, when you're at your worst, not having the strength to turn over in bed. That's right. And then suddenly you're climbing up to the top. The, you know, that's a, a wonderful transformation. That's incredible. Um, you did some other things, too. Uh, that So we have to look at, after the PACE study, and there was something called Osler's Web. Can you just give us two or three sentences about this book called Osler's Web, about a cluster of chronic fatigue, was it? Yeah, so Osler's Web is a really amazing history of chronic fatigue syndrome that starts in the mid-80s when there was a, an outbreak of a mysterious illness in, in Incline Village near Lake Tahoe. And it was this outbreak that led to the term chronic fatigue syndrome being coined by the CDC. The Centers for Disease Control came to investigate, and they um, they developed this new syndrome. It turns out it probably wasn't new. There have been similar episodes in, in many places in times past. Um, and the disease in those other cases has mostly been called myalgic encephalomyelitis rather than chronic fatigue syndrome. So, uh, so chronic it's fatigue, called ME. ME, yes. Okay. And in fact, the name that I use typically is ME-CFS, uh -huh. which puts the two together, and many federal agencies are now using that name. Um, so, and chronic fatigue syndrome is a truly terrible, truly terrible and misleading name for this illness. Because everyone says, oh, I'm tired. Right. Yeah, but I mean, you it can just still it lift sounds your like, foot. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like you're just tired all the time, and that's really not what this yeah. illness is at all. It's not about being tired all the time. Yeah. Um, so, as you started de determining what buildings and what people and places worked for you, you were able to, to really carve out a path. You started working again. That's right. And uh, you met your husband, who is wonderfully supportive right. through all of this. Um, I, I was very interested in your trip to Tasmania. Uh -huh. the, and working, you were a science writer, so you were going to write about these t Tasmanian d devils that have this terrible facial tumors because they bite each other and they... Yeah, I mean, it's just, and they're genetically identical, being this small group of animals only on this island, Tasmania. Right. What I loved was that you saw the huge effort that Australia and Tasmania is doing to save these creatures. After all, they lost a Tasmanian tiger, not, not right. these the devils. And then you thought, I know so many people who are suffering, and there's no money for research. No one is paying attention. Not that we want to take anything away from the Tasmanian right. devils, but why should humans suffer? Talk to me a little bit about are things turning? Are people finally going to start paying attention to these environmental illnesses? Well, it's been an amazing few years. Six and a half years ago was when the PACE trial came out, and there was nothing good happening. At that point, the NIH was spending $5 million a year on research on chronic fatigue syndrome, and nothing on mold illness, literally zero dollars on non-respiratory health effects of mold. Um, in those six and a half years, a bunch of things have happened. There's finally some good journalism. In the past, the journalism about this disease was dreadful, just dreadful. Uh, there's an amazing journalist, David Tuller, who has exposed the problem with the PACE trial, done incredible work. There are a couple of other journalists, including myself, who have done quite a bit of work on the disease. That's been a huge change. The NIH has finally gotten interested in the, in the illness, and they're still not funding it at all the way they should. It's now at $13 million a year instead of $5 million a year, so $13 a patient. So there are about a million patients. S still Trump change. However, they're also doing an internal study of the disease, which I think is really interesting and promising. It'll be really interesting to see what they find with that. And they're just taking it more seriously. So it really feels like there's been a, 
a significant change there, and hopefully eventually real money will follow uh, on that. The patient community has gotten organized in new and really powerful ways. There have been a series of worldwide protests organized by a number of, uh, of patient activist organizations. So it really feels like it's a different it's a different world than it was. Now with mold, which turns out to be the root of the illness for me, and I should I should say I don't believe that mold is the problem for everyone with chronic fatigue syndrome. We just don't know how big a problem it is in the disease. But in terms of the research situation with mold, we're still in pretty bad shape. The um, the scientific community, and I, I explain some of the reasons for this in the book, the scientific community has kind of hardened into a stance where they're extremely skeptical about any non-respiratory effects of mold exposure from uh, water-damaged buildings. And I, to me, looking at the research, there's actually, there's even beyond the experience of people like me, which of course I think should be taken seriously anyway, but even beyond that, there's there are good scientific reasons to think that mold can cause very serious problems beyond respiratory problems. However, the attitudes don't necessarily reflect the science. And one point you make that is I, it's true in my experience that the insurance companies have a lot to do with this attitude about mold. Mm. They just went to the woodshed on asbestos. That's right. So as soon as there started being mold suits, and they're famous people, Ed McMahon, and Bianca Jagger, there are lots of famous mold cases, and they're just, just shut it down. You've got to pay extra to be covered for water damage. And so they just tried to head that off at the pass, and they were very successful. They were. And, and in particular, they were very aggressive in pushing this notion that mold does not cause serious, excuse me, serious health effects. Mm. And, and they really, I mean, they went way beyond what the science said. I mean, they ignored science that made it very clear that mold does have serious health effects. It's very clear that mold is causes, the latest is that mold causes 20% of asthma. That is a huge uh. deal. I mean, asthma kills people, right? This is not a small thing. But they put out the, these position statements from, you know, apparently prestigious organizations saying, no, mold is no big deal. It's just ugly and causes a few minor things. And didn't they find, forgive me, I can't quote you exactly, but there were uh, IQ <clears throat> diminishes uh, That's in, right. in place in, where children under the age of five were raised in a moldy environment, their IQ went down. Yes, that's exactly right. There was a study in Poland, and children who were in moldy schools, um, their IQs dropped by 10 points. So <sighs> that's, and, and, you know, we're just not, we're not following up on this at all. There are, there are a bunch of good reasons to think that mold can cause serious neurological in impacts, but, but, Literally, there, there are zero dollars being spent to study that. And I found three really interesting recent studies identifying entirely new mechanisms by which mold can be damaging us. And in all three cases, these were all really high quality studies, but in all three cases, the researchers could not get funding to follow up on that research, and they had to give up. Except there were one or two who passionately, without being re reimbursed, went, you know, as, as a mission to try to m prove some of these things. I, um, I'm not done with this. I, I want to see what you write in two or three years. You had some experiences with the psychic and with some other things that, that, that early childhood trauma, um, psychological damage, perhaps, who knows, that these are all threads at work in some people, not in everyone. So what I'm looking for is I would love to see in two or three years when this stage gels, mm -hmm. you know, how you look back on it and then what you're doing then. But I want to thank you for, for, for raising this conversation. I think that really, you know, people talk about this sick building syndrome and stuff mm -hmm. and, and um, I just want us to be more compassionate and not to ostracize patients, not to ignore them. And if you know anyone who's suffering from this, say, what can I do to help? Amen. You know, I mean, you were doing laundry, unbelievable amounts of laundry. <laughs> um, I mean, they're just, and, and errand running it, that's just impossible when you don't have the strength to get Absolutely. out of Absolutely. Well, when I was at my sickest, neighbors pitched in for me, you know, got me groceries and 
helped me up the stairs when I couldn't make it, that kind of thing. And I don't know what I would have done without their help. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes left. Sum up uh, for my audience mm -hmm. uh, what they need to know about this, what they need to look for, and really what we all can do besides really encouraging, I know this is a time of austerity and not a lot of money being spent on anything, but how we can encourage more research and how we can actually help people with environmental illness. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I would say we have no idea how big a health threat mold is at this point. We, I couldn't even make an estimate right now about how many people are impacted by mold. Um, what I would say is if you have health problems that you don't have a good explanation for, mold causes so many different effects that it's worth considering for, for almost any a health problem that's not that doesn't have any other compelling explanation and you know to do what I did you have to be really motivated but taking reasonable measures to limit your exposure to mold really makes a lot of sense um, and in terms of encouraging research and supporting patients I think the biggest thing to support patients is just to believe them you know yeah. just believe them yeah. and and take it seriously and the, the experience of having a disease that's poorly understood is that you're always having to sort of fight for legitimacy. Like the most basic aspects of your experience aren't accepted and appreciated by people you know. And so you feel like you drop off the edge of the earth and you're in some alternate universe. And just reaching out and believing people and and asking what you can do to help supporting them, that makes an enormous difference. And what I learned from your hero's journey in your book, we're our own detectives. You can see what makes you feel better, what makes you feel worse. Going out completely uh, from all pathogens out in Death Valley is an extreme way, but you can just notice whenever I go here, I feel terrible. And not going, you know, not doing this makes me feel better. So I encourage everyone to be their own detective. Um, thank you for starting this conversation, and I want to, our guest today is Julie Raymeyer. This book, Through the Shadowlands, a science writer's odyssey into an illness science doesn't understand. Let's all work toward understanding it, and you've made a great step with this gift of your book. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today and report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.